everyone and welcome to this video song for Antier video. My name is Jay Wakefield and today we're going to be taking a look at Linux. Now those of you who have seen my recent videos will know that um, this year I've really really started to seriously use Linux for you know some real world applications. For example, uh, some of you will know that my server runs on Debian 8.2.0 stretch and that I've been experimenting with Debian on my Acer 5742. You'll also know that um, I have a virtual machine on the server that actually, well, don't think I've uh, said in this channel yet but uh, it does run Ubuntu Mate 16.04 and that is something that I will be doing a video on at some point because um, yeah something really good is happening in the 16.04 release of Ubuntu Mate. However the distro of Linux we're going to be taking a look at today is well it's none of those things. In fact, it's not even based on Debian. And it's not even from this decade. Now, what we're going to do today is take a look at the very first distro of Linux that I ever used. Because I wanted to kind of show you guys, you know, I wanted to kind of take you back to, you know, the first time I used Linux and, you know, the excitement that I felt then and you know, the other waddled, the other waddledliness of it and what have you. So, yeah. <clears throat> now, um, the first distro of Linux I did ever use was, um, well, you might be able to see it on the VM screen, the VMware screen there, was uh, Red Hat 8. And I actually got it in the back of a book about Linux, which I got from Waterstones. And, you know, I was really... Yeah, I um, I was um, I was really quite excited about it, and um, I got the book, and um, yeah, I gave it a go, and you know, was really quite impressed with um, the stuff that you could do. Not that I knew much, and I certainly didn't try anything in the terminal at that point because a bit of a scaredy cat, but um. Let's have a look at it now. Let's um, let's see. Let's um, go back to those uh, first days where I was uh, taking my first baby steps into the world of Linux. Now, the first thing you'll notice is it's booted from the CD. Yep, that was quite common back then. You know, it was the early two thousands, but. Um, yeah, I mean, this is what Linux used to look like when booting from a CD. You didn't get an elegant looking menu that um, with which you could use to select um, the type of installation you wanted, or even if you wanted to run it live. Um, you know, that was still, that was still, you know, a couple of years away, really, for at least for the mainstream. You know, it was uh, canonical that brought the idea of a, a live Linux distro that could be run from a CD, they brought that idea to the public. I mean, there the probably were people who did that before. In fact, I'm pretty sure of it. But, um, of course, Ubuntu was the first one that I'd ever heard of that would actually run directly from a CD. Oh, jinx. And it's just automatically started booting. But uh, with this, what you got is a command line interface and you could actually you had to actually specify by typing commands in at that boot prompt what kind of um, what kind of uh, installation environment you were wanting so you could type in uh, I think Linux text to get a text-based installation environment um, or just press enter or just let it continue automatically to get a graphical one now this was something else that it did. Um, I think you can still have Linux do this, but it's it's not that common. 
media integrity check. Now remember um, that on my CDs. Now because we're installing from CD images into VMware, we don't want that. So I'm just going to press the tab key and then skip. <coughs> now because this is um, a virtual machine, it's not able to detect the monitor type or graphics card type. But um, believe it or not, when I was installing this on my 2001 custom built, the monitor that I was using had actually um, it had actually broken, you know, and it was an old monitor, and um, you know, it just kind of got to the end of its life. So um, for a while, I was actually using the Compact Presarios monitor, believe it or not, and um, this installer probed it straight away, the Compact V410. I was um, I was really quite surprised at that. But I mean, that's Linux. It can do that sort of thing, and it can tell you exactly what hardware you've got in your system. Right, okay. <coughs> Welcome to Red Hat Linux. Welcome, this installation process is outlined in detail in the Red Hat Installation Guide, available from Red Hat Incorporated. Please read through the entire manual before you begin, begin this installation progress. HTML and PDF copies of the manual are available online at www.redhat.com docs. There is also an HTML copy on the CD set. If you've purchased an official boxed set, nope, be sure to register your product through our website, www.redhat.com slash app slash activate. Throughout this installation, you'll be able to use your mouse to choose different options. You can also navigate the installation using the tab and enter keys. Use the next and back buttons to progress through these screens. <coughs> Click the next button to save the information and proceed to the next screen. Click the back button to move to the previous screen without saving any information. To minimize this help screen, click on the hide help button. The release notes provide an overview of features that may not have been available for documentation. To view the release notes, click the release notes button and a new screen will appear. Click close to close the release notes and return to the installation program. You can cancel this installation at any time before the about to install screen. When you click next on about to install, package installation will begin and the data will be written to your hard drive. To cancel before the screen, you can safely reboot your system using the reset button or control or delete. Well, isn't that nice? Okay, well, we're gonna click next. And um, <coughs> this is where, you know, the, the real setup starts to begin. Now, one of the things that always struck me about um, this Linux installation was just a number of choices you had, like, you know, on the, um, straight there on the installation set. I mean, multiple languages. If you want that in Windows, generally, you have to buy or download um, a different language version. Um, United Kingdom keyboard layout. And another thing that I liked as well was the idea that, um, you know, I could actually, uh, you know, I've been used to installing pre-XP versions of Windows. So having this showing what appeared to be a lot more than 16 colours off of the bat was really quite something for me. It's actually able to make use of the uh, Visa compatible drivers to do that. Okay. Um, I want a wheel mouse PS2. And we can emulate three buttons as well. <coughs> and now here's where things get interesting. You can select what kind of things you want to install. Now I only got a two disc edition of Red Hat Linux. So, you know, a lot of the options that uh, we're about to see were not available to me at the time. For example, Wine. You know, the uh, Wine is not an emulator. The, the Windows uh, compatibility layer, I think I want to call it. Um, that wasn't available on my Red Hat desk. So let's go to Custom. I like how you had different types of installation you know, you had personal desktop, workstation, server, or custom. Custom. Now, these top three would actually just, uh, you know, it'll just install the most common tools. So I thought that was pretty neat. <coughs> oh, 
automatically partition. Yep. The partition table in the de device HDA was unreadable. To create new partitions, it must be initialized, causing the loss of all data on this drive. Would you like to initialize this drive? Why, yes. Yes, I would. Remove all partitions on this system. Obviously, this is a the equivalent of a brand new drive. <clears throat> I've given this a 10 gig drive, which should be enough for, um, you know, for Red Hat 8. Um, not going to bother with a RAID. The Grub bootloader will be installed on Dev SDA. That's quite funny because I actually, um, I actually remember on my install, I was able to choose either to um, choose either the Grub bootloader or the Lilo bootloader. Oh yeah, and you can on here as well. But I'm just going to use the Grub bootloader because, yeah, yeah. I can also choose to use a bootloader password and click here to configure advanced bootloader options. I'm just going to install the default Grub bootloader configuration. Um, <coughs> I'll automatically configure the network using DHCP. Medium security. Um, So I can choose what I want to allow. I could just use the default fire firewall rules. Yeah, I think I'll do that. <coughs> Actually, um, additional language support. So select the default language for the base system. Um, Great Britain. What's so great about it? Har, 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 har. <clears throat> now, I will say that um, because this is an old version of Linux, when Scotland becomes an independent country, um, this particular installer I don't think will be updated to acknowledge Scotland as its own sovereign nation. However, the latest version of Fedora um, which is actually based on Red Hat, you know, once Scotland becomes independent, I'm pretty sure that Fedora will actually release an update that will acknowledge Scotland as its own nation. So, something to bear in mind there. <coughs> okay, and now you can choose your time zone. Dublin. I always, I always look for uh, Edinburgh, you know, if, if, you know, if they've got Belfast, oh no, they don't, they, they just, duh, okay, now I want to give it a root password, okay, and also, on this screen, I want to create a user. So I'll create myself as a user. And then I'll put my passwords in. Now for most home users, you should be able to ignore this sort of stuff on the home screen. You know, this is this is more. You know, kind of uh, this this is more to do with um, networking. However, if I did want to actually, you know, do Windows networking, I could use this. Okay, so let's click next. Now we get to choose. 
what applications we want to install. So um, <coughs> this comes by default with the X window system. Um, and then you've got the GNOME desktop environment or the KDE desktop environment. And the two are really quite similar actually. And this version of uh, Red Hat. But um, here you, you can see, you know, stuff that you can select. And this is all to do with the desktop environment. Editors, um, you know, the, those are, you know, to edit text files, what have you. Um, there seems to be three of those. It'll tell you how many installed versus how many there are. So it's like you've got Emacs and Vim. So definitely want those, you know, in case I need to do anything. Engineering slash scientific. So you've got, um, you know, programs to help you with engineering tasks. These are all open source programs, by the way, as far as I am aware. I know some uh, boxed Linux versions would actually give you um, some closed source programs like RailPlayer or Adobe Acrobat Reader, stuff like that. You've got um, internet stuff, so um, you've got <coughs> AIM client, um, Galleon. But I do believe, yep, it does. It uh, this version of Red Hat comes with Mozilla, and yeah, I mean, there's there's stuff like that. Um, you've also got text-based internet, so links, for example. Then you've got um, Office software, um, and it does come with them. Um, actually, comes with the Open Office, I believe, this version of Red Hat. And <coughs> I think at least, yep, there we go. And then you've got Mr. Project, I think MR Project, <laughs> well, as opposed to MS Project, Microsoft Project. <laughs> and then you've got, um, yeah, you've got kind of things like that. GNU Cache. Um, And a lot of these programs are still actually around today. You know, for example, uh, Gnumeric and um, Abbey Word. Uh, Sound of Video, Authoring and Publishing. You've got Graphics, Games and Entertainment. Now, this has always been quite fun on Linux because there's been, and there's often, there's actually often been some quite nice games that have, came bundled with Linux. Chromium is a fast-paced arcade-style space shooter. Here's me thinking it was an open-sourced web browser based on Google Chrome. Well, <coughs> what, I could, what I don't know could, could fill the Grand Canyon ten times over. Um, and then you've got different servers that you could have. So you could uh, set up a Windows file server if you wanted to share stuff from your Red Hat 8 computer to Windows machines. I actually do have Samba installed on my actual server and this is how I'm able to share files from it, which is a Linux box, to my main machine, which is a Windows box. Also got development tools and kernel development. So you could recompile the kernel as in the heart of the operating system. You've got GNOME, KDE, and X software development. I mean, I would always install the system tools. I mean, what's this? Amanda Client. I know a few people called Amanda. The client component of the Amanda Tape backup system.
I do have a Colorado tape drive. Perhaps I didn't. Perhaps I should install it on the basis that um, I am Amanda's number one fan. Please, come quat. Um. Or there's um, miscellaneous. I can install either the minimum amount of packages, or literally everything. And you get your total install size and all that good stuff. And then you could select individual packages if you really wanted. Right. Okay. That's that's that sorted. Twenty minutes in, and we're still not installed. But that's all about to change because click next to begin installation of Red Hat Linux. A complete log of the installation can be found in the root slash install dot log file after rebooting your system. A kickstart file containing the installation options selected can be found in the slash root slash anaconda dash ks dot cfg file after rebooting the system. So I've clicked next. It's away formatting the hard drive. Done that. And now it's going to install stuff. And I like how you've got like two progress bars, you know, one for package progress and one for total progress. And then you've got this, you know, total completed remaining. You just don't get this kind of verbosity in Windows installations anymore. You, you just don't. Not that you ever really did, but I mean, I think the last version of Windows whose setup program told you which file it was installing at any given time was actually Windows 3.1 or Windows Workgroups, Windows for Workgroups 3.11. You know, unless you want to count NT4, which kind of did that, and 2000 and XP, which, you know, the text-based portion of setup would do that, but, um, yeah, I mean, this, this is just absolutely fantastic. I, you know, I've always kind of liked how this installation looked. Very pretty. Um, and then you've got a wee bellboard there. Now, this is a multi-disc set, so, you know, by all means go and make a cup of tea, because, you know, you won't have to switch out discs as much, but do be mindful that you will have to switch out the desks at some point. And it will remind it will actually bring up a dialogue box telling you when that needs to happen. Um bit of an anecdote here, just a short one. I remember once installing Red Hat and I had um, I had two drives in my system at the point, even though one was a SCSI drive, but um, obviously Red Hat being Linux, you know, it kinda of saw that straight away, no problem. Um, so what I did is I had disk 1 in one drive and disk 2 in the other drive and I left it installing and as it needed stuff from the second disk so it looked in the second drive and found everything it needed and just went right on going. You wouldn't get that kind of service from Windows, I know that much. And this is not me Windows bashing and saying, oh, well, we shouldn't be using Windows, you know, we should all be using Linux. Because, let's face it, I'm a Windows user on my main machine. You know, I don't, I believe, you know, different operating systems have different uses for different people. I mean, that said, I do believe that one of the best operating systems to ever grace our desktops was uh, Mac OS X Snow Leopard 10.6. Um, that and Tiger and in the Windows world it was uh, Windows 7, Windows XP and of course Windows 98 but you know different people like different operating systems and if it works for them fine if it doesn't and they actually want your advice you can actually turn around and say well based on what you want to do I would say you know based on what you want to do and your hardware I would say that you should try this operating system you know, and then if they need help setting it up, offer them the help and don't be arrogant. I see that way too much on the internet. You know, people being arrogant about their choice of OSs and, you know, I probably, I've, I've no doubt I've been there myself. But, um, you know, it's not a good way to be. You know, and I apologise for the times I may 
have been arrogant about choices of operating systems. No, I apologize for the times I have been arrogant about choices of operating systems, but that's the thing. You know, it's, um, it just kind of, if, you, if you're the sort of person that does that, then this is the reason nobody speaks to you at parties. But yeah, this is going to install now, so, um, time for a cup of tea. So now it's asking for disk 2. So that's exactly what I'm going to give it. And once disk 2 is inserted, all I need to do then is just click OK. CD-ROM could not be mounted. Oh, well, that's nice, isn't it? There we go. So, I'll be back as soon as this is this has completed uh, the file copying process. Okay, so now we're at the end of the file copying process and it's asked me if I want to create a boot diskette. The boot diskette allows me to boot my Red Hat Linux system from a floppy disk. The boot disk allows you to boot your system if your bootloader configuration stops working. If you choose not to install a bootloader or if your third party bootloader does not support Linux, it is highly recommended you create a boot, um, a boot disk. Now I can't properly remember, but I do believe that um, this boot disk will actually boot the system up. But um, I don't remember. So you know, just for kicks and grins, why don't cre why don't we create one? So I've clicked yes. I'd like to create a boot disk. Now I'm going to click on next. Please remove any diskettes from the floppy drive and insert the floppy diskette that is to contain the boot disk. All data will be erased during creation of the boot disk. Creating boot disk. And there we go. Um, obviously on a real floppy drive that would take much longer. So now I'm just going to go and disconnect the floppy drive. Uh, graphical interface X configuration. In most cases the video hardware can be automatically detected. If the detected settings are not correct for the hardware select the right settings. Now this I'm going to actually select you know just the VESA driver genetic um, video card RAM I don't believe it has 32 megs I believe it does have I'm not sure if it's 16 or 8 let's go for 8 just to be on the safe side um, and like I said earlier we're using the VESA driver genetic on my 2001 custom belt, of course, this was detected as the Trident Cyberblade 3D. So I'm going to click Next. Um, unprobed, unprobed monitor. You know, we're just I'll just go with that. High color, 16 bit, and we'll go with 800 by 600. And I can choose either a text login or graphical. We'll go for graphical. Now let's test the settings. And look, we've got different color depths that we can choose from. So the graphics mo graphic mode eight hundred by six hundred pixels with sixteen bit per pixel. Can you see this message? Yeah. Oh. Damn it. Yeah, you've got to be quick on that. And I don't know why the text is really small on that window. Okay, there we go. 
Congratulations, the installation is now complete. Remove any installation media, diskettes or CD-ROMs used during the installation. If you created a boot diskette to boot the system, insert it before rebooting. For information on um, errata, updates and bug, bug fixes, visit redhat.com slash errata. For information on automatic updates through Red Hat Network, visit R, um, rhn.redhat.com. For more information on use, using and configuring the system, visit redhat.com slash docs, redhat.com slash apps slash support. To register the product, visit redhat.com slash apps slash activate. Press exit to reboot the system. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And yep, it's ejected the disk drive. And now we're actually in the grub boot loader. And um, you know we can press enter to boot, or it will do so automatically in five seconds. Just like the modern day grub boot loader would. And this was when you really didn't get any kind of a splash screen on Linux. You know, you got the verbose boot as the as a default. I quite like having that though, you know, because you can see exactly what's going on with your system at any given time. You know, and if something's going wrong, yeah, you, know, you don't have to you don't have to do anything special to try and find that out. <clears throat> Okay, now this will appear once only. Welcome to the Red Hat. Li welcome to Red Hat Linux. Um, hi, welcome to the Red Hat Setup Agent. This is, I guess, this is the out of the box experience, or what you would call that. And a lot of Linux distros, this is actually done during the setup process, uh, setup process itself. But you know, here you've got welcome, date and time, sound card, update agent additional CDs finish setup. <clears throat> there are a few more steps to take before your system is ready to use. The Red Hat Setup Agent will now guide you through some basic configuration. Please check the please click the forward button in the lower right corner to continue. So do we want yep we've got the um, date and time. Could also enable the network time protocol. We can set the date and time manually. Contacting an NTP server, please wait. <laughs> Seems to actually work. Um, <coughs> so we've also got the sound card. Does Red Hat play nicely with the um, sound on VMware? Well, we can find out by playing the test sound. If it does work, we will hear a very nice wee tune. It does, but very, very quietly. A sound card has been detected on your computer. Click the play test sound to hear a sample sound. You should hear a series of three sounds. The first sound will be in the right channel, the second sound will be in the left channel, and the third sound will be in the center. Would you like to register? No, I don't. And then you can actually install additional software either from the Red Hat Linux documentation CD, installation CD, or additional CDs. Forward. Congratulations, your Red Hat Linux system is now set up and ready to use. We hope that you will have a pleasant computing experience. Please click the forward button in the lower right corner to continue. And there we have it. I'm now ready to log on. So that's exactly, oh, did I not, <laughs> whoopsie, didn't actually uh, put in a local host name. Whoops, forgot to do that. And um, 
my Linux network at least has its own domain. Anyways, let's log on. Do you remember when Linux used to do this? <laughs> and here we are at the Red Hat desktop. So what do we have here? Well, what you're looking at is a very dated version of GNOME, um, but still quite good actually. I remember, um, I remember seeing that red fedora at the bottom. Um, I'm not sure the latest version of uh, the virtual, the VMware tools will work with this, so um, let's not even bother with that. There's an exclamation mark. Welcome to the Red Hat Network Alert Notification Tool. This program will keep will help you determine at a glance if your system is in need of critical software updates. Click next to begin the configuration. I mean, I remember, um, <laughs> of course, there's been an error. <laughs> Who who would think that after fourteen years or so, this um, the server that deals with this version of Red Hat would still be up? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, your system does not seem to be registered with Red Hat. The So, what do we have on this system then? Well, we've got, um, I mean, we have a dictionary. I mean, that's that is pretty darn, darn good, actually, I must admit. Um, see if it, um, yep. Gerrymander. Gerrymandered. Gerrymandering. To divide a state into districts for the choice of representatives in an un, in a non natural and unfair way, with a view to give a political party an advantage over its uh, over its opponent. So that's pretty good, actually. The fact that you've got a dictionary in this. I mean, they, these features are kind of unheard of coming with Windows, and um, and this thing. Okay, it doesn't actually work anymore, but um, this is kind of the equivalent of the uh, Windows Security Center, Action Center, I believe it's known now, um, that debuted with Windows XP Service Pack 2. And, um, you know, I mean, back then, you know, back when I first tried it, the beginning of 2003, the Security Center wasn't a thing then. And, um, I think some of us preferred it that way because the Windows XP Security Center, oh my goodness, it was a headache and a half. It's a lot less intrusive now, but yeah. Then we've got games. Yeah, so these are like very kind of simple games. And a lot of them take their inspiration from games in the Windows Entertainment Pack. So, um, Tetravex. You know, we um, we saw LGR playing that. So, um, why don't we have a shot? <coughs> why don't I have a shot? Let's let's see if I can actually um, let's see if I can actually do anything with this. I don't see any ones. So that could be a thing. Or it could be that. You just don't know. Or it could be that. You just kind of, yeah, you've kind of got to look out for, you know what the numbers are, 
for example, I mean this. This could be a thing, but then again, so could that. I mean. <laughs> Six, four. No. <laughs> Now it's doing so well until yeah. There we go. <clears throat> so you've got things like that that are pretty cool, and then you've got um. I believe there is a version of uh, Rattler Rice for this as well. Um, I believe there's a My Young clone. Certainly Backgammon. And I seem to have installed all the KDE games as well. So that, that was that was that was very good. Oh my goodness, Jones. <laughs> There's absolutely no way I'm going to be able to do that. Um, let's see if I... There's good old mines. <clears throat> and this one looks quite interesting. It's a KDE app, but still it works. Oh yes. A version of Tetris. I mean, why not? <laughs> and I love the wee guide you get. This is brilliant. See, as you can see, I mean, KDE and GNOME looked quite similar. So it's like, you know, you ran a KDE app under GNOME. And it just didn't seem as big of a deal back then. You know, we... It was a much simpler time, I think. You know, we... <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think that's what it is. It, it was. It was a much simpler time. Um, uh, yeah, I, I did well there. I, I did so well. Yeah, I'm messing up pretty bad now. You know what? See if I can build a line here and then yeah, we'll just we'll just kinda of play it by ear, I guess, you know, see what goes on. Run it up the flagpole and see which way it blows. As this will be a perfect fit. Uh oh, oh. See, actually, this is where I think Tetris gets the most interesting, you know, when you're trying to wrestle your way out of a sticky wicket. I mean, I'd, I wouldn't like to imagine how said wicket got sticky, but uh, you can. Yeah.
This is going to end well. I, I can feel it. <laughs> so yeah, I mean that's that's good. You've got Tetris. Let's see if I can actually now see let's see if I can get Tux Racer. Cause I can only seem to get up to the S's up here and that's a bit annoying. Right. I I just yeah. Oh well. Um I've got graphics PDF viewer, um, the GIMP, and that's pretty good. I mean, this—I <clears throat> think this was the first time I'd ever heard of it, and you know, I—I uh, I remember at the time GIMP was a word that one would use to describe an idiot, especially down in Yorkshire. It's like, oh, you're such a GIMP. It's kind of like how tube is seen as an insult in Scotland. So, you know, of course, there's those people who think that YouTube was a website that you probably shouldn't be visiting. Um, then we've got the web browser. I mean, is this does this connect to the internet? Does it actually do a thing? I think it does. Oops. So used to the double click to maximize thing. This this still use slide. Let's give it a go. Probably the worst possible website I could visit on Linux, but we know that that works. Ah yes, toastytech.com. I love it. This, if you view this page in any version of Internet Explorer, it will say, please update your browser. If I use a 14-year-old version of the Mozilla browser, however, it's absolutely fine. Don't need to update it. So, yeah. <laughs> And then we've got, um, we have open office programming, Emacs, server settings, sound recorder, volume control. Jings, root, root password, terminal, trace note. And then we've got extras. I've always wondered about this. Like just extras, it's yeah. Oh, and there's Tux Racer. Let's see how it runs. Well, I've um, I've lost the mouse pointer, so that's that's got to be good. <laughs> oh, I've done. Well, it's working well. <laughs> I don't know why there's that extras option there, but uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not good at Tux Racer at the best of times, but this is just comical. I, I yeah, I, th I think it's time to quit. But um, as for, um, before I go, I might just have a wee look at, um, you know, I think it would be an idea to have a look at the accessibility because, you know, I've been losing the mouse pointer all through this video. So why not, why don't we have a look and see if we can actually, you know, make it so that we might actually be able to see something. Nope, that's not going to do it. I think it's more preferences. First of all, we can take a look at the accessibility options. Enable keyboard accessibility, 
beep when enabling disabling keyboard accessibility features. So you've got mouse keys, which lets you use the keyboard to control the mouse pointer. Bounce keys, um, you know, which for, which will ignore a certain number of repeated keystrokes. Um, slow keys only accept key presses after so many milliseconds. <clears throat> and sticky keys, um, and that is basically if you've got to press multiple keys instead of pressing them at the same time, you can press them one by one. If there's one thing I've found, I found the large cursor. And apparently I'm going to need to log out and back in again for that to take effect. And finally, I have a larger mouse pointer. Brilliant. And under font, if I wanted, I could actually change, I could actually change up the application font. And see, that's actually made everything a wee bit bigger. Yep. There we go. Terminal font. <coughs> there you have it. You know, we're actually starting to make this look more accessible, which is fantastic. <laughs> Let's just have a wee peek in at um, an old version of OpenOffice. OpenOffice.org 1.0. Oh. I remember, I remember this. Could import my external address book. Oh wow, this is what it used to look like. Oh my goodness. See if I can actually go for a whole page view or a page width. No. This is openoffice.org 1.0. I can't believe how they were able to just totally rip off Star Office and get away with it. Damn liberals and their red paint and their teal hair and their tiny little dogs that self identify as cats. This isn't the way it used to be. This isn't the way it used to be at all. And then I can save it. And I am well aware that um, OpenOffice.org is actually the open source version of Star Office. That uh, some microsystems, yeah, they actually did make the code open source. Anyway, I think it is time to end this video. So we'll just shut this down. And. I would like to thank you all for watching my video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please feel free to subscribe to my channel, to like videos on Frontier on Facebook, and follow me on Twitter. But for the meantime, thank you for watching this video. And